Welcome back. You're watching Climate Change Perspectives. Minister, let's touch on the big debate with regards to industrialized nations versus non-industrialized nations and the mm -hmm. fact that we're starting to see quite a big debate raging on as to what the role of emerging markets should be. We know that our uh, very big focus in South Africa is coal-fired power plants mm -hmm. and of course we know that that is very detrimental uh, to the uh, environment but good for the economy is a sense because we're using that resource. What is your mm -hmm. stance on this debate? Well, I should have said to you, Eleni, that uh, at this point, I shouldn't be getting deeper into a national position because I have to remain neutral. Uh, so I would leave that question to Minister Malewa, who is the leader of the South African delegation to COP17. Because the minute I start mixing my role with hers, uh, then I'll confuse the 194 mem uh, party members. And I think could, could maybe the uh, comments on the, the being a traditional mm -hmm. uh, tug of war between North and South around mm -hmm. these big issues. In fact, you touched on it earlier mm -hmm. on the, the mechanisms required when, when uh, His Excellency President Zuma mm -hmm. indicated that in Copenhagen as mm -hmm. part of trying to salvage the conference, mm -hmm. you know, we'll cut this by 34 yeah. percent. Uh, it was conditional. Mm -hmm. And I think that conditionality without talking to, South, to the South African space at all, mm -hmm. but talking generally, do you find that's the same expectation across the developing world uh, and developing countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, what, what was beginning to emerge change? in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Panama when I listened to the conversations of the negotiators, particularly uh, the regional uh, groupings that uh, came to brief me, uh, was that uh, Th there's convergence, particularly led by the European Union, listening more and more to the views of Africa in particular, developing countries, and countries that are referred to as the seeds, the small island and developing states. That the Europeans, by the way, through the European Union, had signed on the first uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol. And they're also saying that they're prepared to talk with emerging and large economies from the developing world as long as we use the second commitment period as a bridge to move towards a possibility of us starting a discussion on a future uh, climate change framework. Even if we don't conclude the discussions in Durban, but if we just find a way to say there's a need for us to start discussing the future beyond this. The, these other developed countries who were signatories to the first commitment period of Kyoto are saying that they want to see efforts also from developing countries. Like I said earlier on, that's why the uh, notion of common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities come in. That developing countries, if you check on their track record, are actually really, really doing their best despite limited resources. But those who are our historical emitters, who had actually acknowledged that fact, the common but differentiated uh, responsibility mean that they really have to take more responsibility because of this historical fact that uh, industrial revolution accelerated global warming and greenhouse gases emissions. What is your view on carbon credits? Because that's in a sense, the incentive for emerging markets to uh, ensure that they save mm -hmm. and they reduce their carbon footprints and then they get monetary gain for it. We know that that is also a very hotly debated issue and we know that the European Union is also really looking at this because it's actually costing quite a bit. Well, I think the time has, uh, has come now that the global citizenry expect leadership both from developed and developing country but more from the developed world. So because the UNFCCC come through a give and take uh, negotiated uh, outcomes, it's important that leadership encourages to come to the table, bring all positive efforts to make sure that we do not come to the table saying, I am for the brown economy against the green economy, but that we find a way as the unions are saying that they want transition justice. That is, as we transit 
from the old economy into the new or grow, a green economy, jobs and job losses uh, are limited. So that's why Africa has a common position that please remember that for Africans and also for small island and developing countries, the key outcome for Devon will be how they get supported in adaptation efforts. So, because so that you don't just look at carbon credits, but you say, as promised, we are able to confirm that 30 billion has been coming their way so that they could help themselves to adapt while they're also bringing in mitigation efforts. Uh, in Africa, the most important thing is, which I'm very proud of as a woman, it's a fact, and I'm sure Daniel would agree, that in Africa, 80% of food production is by women, and in particular, rural women. But remember that the agriculture that they lead, it's rain-fed. So the direct impact on their livelihoods and on how they feed their families come on or depend on how they are assisted with the erratic weather patterns to be able to adapt and continue doing what they are, they are good at, not fighting wars, but feeding yeah. their but nations. You know, I think also when you talk about the African women, I think what must have shocked you a few days ago mm -hmm. are when the peoples of Vanavatu found themselves with no fresh water, mm -hmm. a small island state yeah. in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, and some would argue uh, that this is uh, one of the earlier indicators mm -hmm. of the impacts of climate change yes. and that water has to be brought in yes. all the way from Australia. What, what, what are your views on, on the impacts not only Yes, in Africa, uh, in but agriculture, in mm -hmm. but also in the small island states who have been instrumental in, in trying to fight a strong and battle. And that's why through the G77 plus China, a very strong group of almost like 130 countries, I've had an opportunity to address the negotiators from G77 plus China, majority of which are African countries and the seeds or the small island developing states. They say when, you t when they talk of adaptation for LDCs and other developing countries, it's really adaptation which brings about issues around food security and energy security. For small island and developing states, it's a matter of survival. So they say and emphasize this point, which they made to President Zuma uh, earlier on, that for them, when you put adaptation, put stroke, survival. And I keep remembering and hearing the words of the foreign minister of Kiribati, reminding me about the Vanatu situation. Uh, in, in the last uh, Commonwealth uh, Choga meeting in Trinidad and Tobacco, they've asked for a special meeting with the president and they said to him, through the Kiribati foreign minister, she said that her mother, a villager in a small island in Kiribati, who has always known weather patterns in the area where they live, would do, wash her kitchen utensils and put them out in the sun to dry up during low tide. And for her, low tide is early morning until near midday. But because of this erratic weather patterns, high tide comes right in the middle of the day, and the poor old woman would come out and find that all her pots and pens, pots and pens and plates have been washed away. So it's a matter of survival. So these issues are really quite critical, and that's why they say leadership of the globe should not fail them. They want us to use second commitment on Kyoto Protocol is a breach. Let's do the give and take. They are prepared to operationalize on the agreements or outcomes of Cancun. They are looking forward to us compromising not on the second commitment period as a bridge into the future where we can begin to look at discussions around future framework moving into the future together with developed and developing countries. Minister, from the examples that you've used, mm -hmm. it seems that we cannot reverse what we've done already as humanity. And we really are hinging our hopes at what will happen in mm -hmm. Durban. And mm -hmm. you're talking about policy and we're talking about framework and, and yes. uh, the framework that's going to be put on the table and the drafts that we see. Mm -hmm. But the point is that we cannot actually procrastinate any longer. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done now. Yeah. Does it scare you that perhaps things could go wrong at this meeting and that there won't be a, a, a decision made on the next Kyoto Protocol or that leaders won't stand up together and say, well, this is what decisive action we're going to take. Let's put politics aside and do what we need to do. And if I may, Minister, just yes. tag on to a very important question that mm -hmm. Alani has put across. And how much and how far is business? Uh, 
civil society, we know where they stand, mm -hmm. but where, where is business coming to the table in trying to move this process forward? Well, interestingly, when I was appointed in February, I was very worried. I actually thought, wow, what have I done to deserve this quietly? But having been uh, cr crisscrossing the globe, uh, nudging, encouraging leaders around the globe, around the world, to start listening to what science say, that we have to work to keep the global temperatures below two degrees, that we are way, way above two degrees at the moment. We need to work together to bring it down. Science say we don't have time. Now, what I've been hearing, particularly in Panama, I went there literally praying, thinking, wow, if there's a fall apart here, apart here, because this was the last intersessional meeting. What I found there, as I said earlier on, was more convergence than divergence. And that's what gives me hope, that leadership does not have time. Time is not on our side. We are not overly ambitious. We are asking for a comprehensive, balanced, and realistic outcome, reached through fairness and consensus in Durban. So therefore, we are not asking for a legally binding agreement on the future framework in Durban. What we are hearing from party members is that if we were to operationalize all outcomes of Cancun that deals with the immediate and also sign on the second commitment of Kyoto and work on the elements, some few elements of what we refer to as the future uh, framework, and then continue working on issues of the adaptation committee, the framework, and so on, party members say they will be happy. The developed world say we mustn't just talk second commitment and we say nothing about the future framework. That's what they're saying. So I think we are beginning to see convergence in what I've said. Time, I agree with you, is not on our side. Daniel. And we think we've got a very positive outcome coming in Durban. I am optimistic. Daniel, are you optimistic? Cup 17. I, th I think we've got our back against the wall. I think the minister has probably given us a more positive message. And mm -hmm. I think over the next couple of uh, episodes, mm -hmm. we'll explore those uh, okay. with you, Eleni, and uh, yeah, with the absolutely. minister. And minister, just uh, some last thoughts from you. Well, like I said, in the party-driven process, all 194 uh, party members will find South Africa ready. South Africa is ready. Uh, with their support, we would say we've done it before. We'll try not to disappoint them, but the outcome is in their hands. We are ready to support a positive outcome. And I hope we are ready to make all those needed decisions. Thank you so very Definitely. much, Minister, for joining us. Great to have you on the program.